<clears throat> Hello, welcome to this week's theology study. As we've been developing this whole idea of common grace in this series, and uh, today I want to talk about common grace in the societal realm, how it affects society. And, and the fact that any society at all exists is evidence of God's common grace. That there are mores and cultural constraints is cause to be grateful to God for his common grace. Now you may think that there aren't constraints, but that is only because you haven't considered the full extent of the absence of constraint. If there were no laws, if there was no police force, if there were no expectations of society, and everyone just did what was right in their own eyes, um, what a mess that would be. And so we have God's common grace to thank for that in terms of morality and society. And so when we look at that, God's grace is evidence in the existence of various organizations and structures in human society. And, and that's where we begin to see it. When we think of God's common grace in the societal realm, we can think of different examples of organizations and structures that exist that really manifest God's common grace that wouldn't exist if man were completely left to his own devices. And the first, unit, the first example that we have is the family unit. That uh, when we think about it, that people go on loving their kids and, and, and husbands and wives stay together and people work things out and the family unit continues to exist regardless of the condition of our society. That is, therein is common grace. And we first see that example in, in the scriptures in Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve remained husband and wife after the fall. And then they had children, and which were both sons and daughters. And it says that in Genesis 5, 4, after Adam became the father of Seth, he lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. And we also know that their children married and had sons and daughters. And in fact, the Bible tells about Cain, who was the first murderer in history, who killed his own brother, and Cain went out and got married and had kids and developed a whole lineage. That's common grace. And the human family unit is present to this day. And not just for believers, but for all people. And this is indeed an act of grace. That families can love without being believers. And, and we see that. I, I've often referred to that as the image of God is very powerful even in fallen man. And when we see people who don't believe in the Lord continue to do the right things by their family and show care and concern, that's the image of God showing through even in their fallen state. That is an act of common grace. And so we can appreciate that. Now, if we were to develop this idea even more, and we think in terms of human government, uh, human government is also the result of common grace. That without God's common grace, there would be no government. Now, some of you might think that's a good thing, but trust me, anarchy is not the answer to the world's problems. And, and we see, first of all, this idea of human government being instituted even, even when Noah gets off the, the ark after the post-flood. In Genesis 9-6 it says this, Whoever sheds human blood by humans, his blood will be shed, because in the image of God, God made humans. Right there, we see God instituting governmental constraint against murder. That's good news. And, and clearly it's stated at, that God establishes government in Romans, and I want to read that passage, it's Romans 13-4 says, the government is God's servant working for you. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. The government has the right to carry out the death sentence. It is God's servant, an avenger to execute God's anger on anyone who does what is wrong. And, and so we see that even the government is institute, being instituted as an act of God's common grace. Now, I've heard people argue, well, yeah, but what about a corrupt government? There was no government more corrupt in the Roman Empire at the time that this was written. That when you, you need to remember when this says the government is God's servant punishing wrongdoing, it's the same government that was allowing people to throw their babies away if they were female 
uh, it was the same government that crucified the Lord Jesus. It was the same government that uh, beheaded Paul. Uh, so, so when we think about, you know, people say, oh, I don't know about corrupt government. This scripture was established during corrupt government. God has an expectation that we respond to government as something that he instituted as an act of common grace to protect humanity. And we should be grateful for God's common grace, for without it, the earth wouldn't be fit to live on. And, and we continue to look at this, that uh, human government is one of the primary means used to restrain evil in the world. And, 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 you know, if you just pause for a minute and think about that, that it's actually government that restrains evil in the world. Human laws and police forces are, as well as the judicial system, provide a powerful deterrent to evil actions. Now, uh, I, I know people protest and say, well, well everything is going badly. Uh, it, it could be a lot worse. And, and, you know, the purpose of the jail system, the purpose of the judicial system, all those things, is to protect the innocent from those who perpetrate wrongdoing. And not necessarily rehabilitation, but the protection of the innocent. And, and we begin to see that this is very helpful in light of the kind of evil in the world that is irrational and that can only be restrained by force. And we know that that exists, that in man's fallen state, there is an irrational evil in the world that can only be restrained by force. And with that in mind, God instituted government to restrain that. That there, Believe me, there are people honoring boundaries. There are people ref not committing crimes, and the only reason is because there is a there's a restraining force in our world. If you were to take that restraining force out, you would discover there are more evil people around you than you thought. And, and we also need to understand that such an evil will not be deterred by reason or education. And, and that's where uh, humanity makes certain mistakes that we think, well, if we, just, if we just reason with people, if we just educate them, then uh, they, they'll quit being evil. That would be true if man wasn't fallen. If man was in his original created state, that, that might have been true. Might have been true. But remember, man in his original state sinned. But that's the problem with humanism. It denies the existence of God and it denies the fall of man. Uh, so it, it expects that there's good in man even if man's unredeemed. And what we have to understand there isn't. And, and so there is an evil out there that, that can't be reasoned with and you can't educate people out of it. And therefore, government institutions exist as an act of common grace that prevent evil from spreading throughout a society. Of course, the sinfulness of man can also affect governments themselves. We do know that. We've seen that in history. Thus, the government like all of God's common grace blessings, can be used for either good or evil purposes. And, and what we get out of that is the problem isn't the existence of government. The problem is the existence of evil and that it can permeate all walks of life. Even when you hear stories of churches that have gone awry, the problem isn't the church. The problem is evil that gets into the church. And so... so we, we have to make those distinctions. Now, there are other organizations in, in human society that manifest common grace. We have educational institutions. That's an act of common grace, that we would educate people and that they could learn. We have businesses and corporations. And, and you say, well, business and corporations, I don't know how I feel about that. Well, if you eat in a restaurant, you apparently like businesses. If, uh, if you buy gasoline, you're benefiting from a corporation. Uh, it's not an either or, it's a both and scenario a lot of times. And, and then there are volunteer groups that are charitable. And some of them aren't Christian, but they're charitable volunteer groups. This is an act of common grace. There are, there are groups that feed people, that help with medical supplies, that, that help uh, different issues in the world, that, that help with agriculture. And on and on it goes. And all of this kindness that exists is the result of common grace. 
And, and so even friendships, the fact that man in his fallen state, not believing in God, can still make friends and have relationships is God's grace. And so God's common grace is manifest in the world for the good of the church. And, and we really need to give thanks to the Lord for that. You know, I hear a lot of Christians complaining about the condition of the world, and, and I get it. But, uh, you know, maybe before you gripe about the condition of the world, you should consider what the condition of the world would be if God's common grace wasn't in it. And that uh, God's grace... That is manifested to all. And some, some might think, well, well, unbelievers shouldn't get God's common grace. You wouldn't want to live on earth if unbelievers weren't receiving common grace from God. It wouldn't be a place you want to be. And, and <clears throat> because this common grace exists for the good of the church. And we can see that in the scripture in Ephesians 1.22. It says, God has put everything under the control of Christ. He has made Christ the head of everything for the good of the church, his bride. Now, think about that, that, that all this good stuff that's still happening is for the good of the bride, not, the, not necessarily the good of the lost, and certainly not just the good of the, the planet itself, the third rock from the sun. The, 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 the common grace that's there is to benefit the bride of Christ. And it allows us to live in humanity. And, and think about this. You wouldn't want to still be on planet Earth when the church leaves. Now, maybe you're not a believer and you, you say, well, I don't believe in God, and, and I don't, or I believe in Him and I don't want to walk with Him, etc. That doesn't matter. When God's bride, when the church leaves, you don't want to be on planet earth because God's common grace will no longer reside here. And where God removes his common grace from the earth, it will become a very hellish place. And you could say, oh, it's hellish now. No, it's not. You can't even imagine what it will be like. If God removes his common grace. And when the church goes, remember it exists for the good of the church. So when the church is in heaven, common grace isn't necessary on earth anymore. And it will be a horrible place and men won't have conscience. And in fact, we read that in the Revelation. Once the bowls of wrath are being poured out, it says, And yet man will not repent. It tells you how hard-hearted man becomes without God's common grace. And so if we think that fallen man, when the, when the church leaves at the second coming of Christ, when the bride of Christ goes to be with the Lord, fallen man is left completely to his own devices. So the Lord will give, you know, so, so think about that. The Lord will, will no longer restrain evil in this world. Um, what a shocking thing that will be. So just let's give the Lord a praise. Lord, we just give you thanks for your common grace uh, that you would you would be so kind as to preserve any goodness in this world that you might preserve the church and we're thankful for it in jesus name amen so lord bless you and um we'll we'll look at the religious realm next